So I'm just looking at the time um, and we can probably get started. Before we do, um, I'm just going to give a land acknowledgement. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge that we, um, I am hosting this webinar from the unceded Mi'kmaq territory of Jibuktuk. Um, and as we have discussions about climate and our shared environment, uh, we should remember our relationship to this land and follow the leading examples of the Mi'kmaq people who are, have sustained strong relationships with land and water stretching over millennia. And it's also important to recognize that land acknowledgements alone are not enough and only a small part of disrupting and dismantling colonial structures. Um, and it's also important to support Indigenous nations and the work that they do to build their communities and beyond. Thank you and Wolong. So with that said, um, welcome everyone to the Better Building Speaker Series. Um, it is a webinar that the Ecology Action Center hosts in partnership with Efficiency Nova Scotia um, with the intention of bringing together building professionals, homeowners, anyone with a general interest in buildings to um, talk about energy efficiency and different uh, solutions and benefits um, that you can find within the efficiency sector. Today, <laughs> we are joined uh, by the Efficiency Canada research team um, who released their 2022 energy efficiency scorecard for provinces and territories um, back in December, I think, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and today they're going to chat with us a bit about um, the scorecard and Nova Scotia's performance over the last year. So we have Brendan Haley, Alyssa Nabard, and James Gade with us, and I'll let them introduce themselves and uh, get started without further ado, if that's good with everybody. Thanks, Claire. We are very happy to be here today, happy to have everyone with us. So thank you for taking some time out of your day to attend. Um, as Claire mentioned, it'll be myself, uh, Brendan, and James, and we're going to go through some of the findings of our 2022 energy efficiency scorecard, both as they relate specifically to Nova Scotia and then kind of the broader um, building space across Canada. So let's get started. Okay, so first we're going to start out with uh, what is the scorecard? So this is the fourth year that uh, Efficiency Canada has released a scorecard. Uh, in it, we track efficiency policies and program outcomes so that there's a tons of things we track. Uh, both the qualitative and quantitative side. Ultimately, what we want this report to do is to benchmark efficiency performances across the country. We want to share best practices. Um, we want it to be a tool for folks like policymakers, activists, and then of course, kind of the fun side is promoting a little bit of friendly competition amongst the provinces and territories. Okay, so we um, we score out of a total of 100 points. Um, this year, Nova Scotia moved up one ranking spot, so from third last year to second this year, which was uh, pretty ex uh, exciting for the province. Uh, so surpassing Quebec is uh, what took place in 2022. This change in rank was propelled uh, largely by improvements in energy efficiency program results. So as you can see in the uh, in the table here, the province leads the program section. Um, scoring a total of 21 out of possible 40 points. All right, so we're going to dig a little bit further into uh, specific metrics here and, and see uh, what Nova Scotia was able to achieve. Okay, so we're looking at um, annual electricity savings. Obviously, Nova Scotia ranks first in this metric, uh, saving a total of 0.98% uh, of sales uh, this past year, or I guess I should say in 2021. Um, so this is largely the result of the work done by Efficiency Nova Scotia and the Efficiency Utility in the province. As I mentioned, program outcomes um, improved this past year, which helped propelled, uh, propel the province past Quebec in this section. We also look at um, electricity savings targets. So this is kind of an average um, uh, average targets over a planning period. In terms of Nova Scotia this year, we look specifically at data from 2022 and what the province was aiming to achieve. Um, ranking first in the uh, scorecard 
with 1.10% um, of target. So this isn't in the scorecard. Um, however, it's a little bit of a sneak peek at some work that we're doing where we're comparing um, states and provinces in this past year in terms of their electricity savings. So as we saw, Nova Scotia performed very, uh, very well or uh, ranked first in the in the country in terms of their electricity savings. Now, when we compare provinces and states, we see that of the top 20 performers or the top 20 top 20 achievers, uh, Nova Scotia ranks about 17th in that uh, in that section. So um, we know that Nova Scotia is doing some great work. We also know that there is more room to uh, kind of keep keep stretching for more and more savings. I'm going to pass it over to uh, James now. Awesome. Uh, thanks, Alyssa. And sorry, everybody that I can't um, be like visually with you all. My internet is down. So I'm doing the doing going to try to do this presentation for my phone. I hope that's not too much of an inconvenience for you all, um, but you probably won't miss much because uh, you really just need to hear me say what's on the slides. So one of the other things that we track in the scorecard is spending on energy efficiency programs for low income communities. So in most provinces, that's that these are energy efficiency programs that are, tar that are targeted um, toward people that fall be below a certain income threshold. Um, now, obviously, that varies quite quite a, well, it varies a little bit from province to province in terms of what those thresholds are. Um, but uh, generally speaking, um, that's what a low income energy efficiency program is. So we track that in the scorecard and we benchmark that spending uh, aggregated to the whole, like to the provincial level. We benchmark it by dividing it uh, by the number of individuals falling below the low income measure, which is a statistics. Canada uh, statistic um, that's used to measure um, income inequality. So as you can see, Nova Scotia actually performs quite well on this metric. Uh, in 2021, we've, we estimate that um, low income program spending in Nova Scotia worked out to about $91 per person, um, <clears throat> excuse me, falling below that low income threshold. Um, this is, you know, beat only by PEI, which is, a, you know, a bit of an anomaly when you look at the rest of the provinces. However, I should say uh, that we do expect that Nova Scotia's spending on low-income energy efficiency programs will grow quite significantly in the years to come. This data is showing spending for the year 2021. So in Nova Scotia, that's the calendar year of 2021, January to Feb or January to December. Um, so it does not capture the planned spending for low income programs that will be rolling out over the next couple of years. Um, and from what we've seen, the, uh, the latest plan from Efficiency Nova Scotia is to really ramp up um, spending on low income programs. So we're excited to see that grow quite a bit in the years to come. Uh, Alyssa, could you switch the slides, please? Uh, yet another reason why that spending will go up uh, is the you know the recently uh, announced i guess it's recent recently announced um initiatives from the federal government to provide grants specifically to help um uh to help people switch from from what we would call in the scorecard non-regulated fuels but in this case it's largely heating oil to heat pumps in buildings um so this is a, a new tranche of spending from the federal government but because of the peculiarities of the way that it happens to work and uh, nova scotia is one of the one of the few provinces that have a special agreement with the federal government, um, the spending associated with this program will probably show up in Nova Scotia's uh, provincial low-income energy efficiency spending in, in the years to come, which will help boost it even further. Now, that being said, um, I don't. I, I think it's important to note that um, while this is a really important step forward um, to you know energy justice and and supporting people, low to moderate income people, adapt to uh, and 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 prepare for the low low carbon transition. Um, the federal the federal program really just doesn't go quite far enough. Um, a whole home approach would also include support specifically for like building improvements, but also non energy upgrades that are often needed before you can before you can undertake the the kind of I guess deeper energy efficiency upgrades like space space heating, uh, fuel switching, and and improved building envelope. Um, the other thing to note is it's the federal, the federal, uh, this federal program is specifically for heating oil, um, but across all of Canada, um, 
you know, non, not these non-regular fuels or heating oil are not quite as prevalent as they are in, in uh, Atlantic Canada. And in fact, 90% of, you know, across Canada, average, uh, the average spending electric, sorry, the average energy spending for people, low income people uh, is 90% goes to electricity and natural gas, which is not actually covered uh, uh, with this new funding. So it's important to note that even though this is a step in the right direction, we still need a more comprehensive federal uh, low to moderate income energy efficiency strategy. Next slide, please. Okay, another thing that we track in the scorecard, which is intended to kind of get at the provincial capacity to undertake and advise uh, on energy efficiency upgrades and raise awareness is we track the number of uh, energy advisors, um, Energide energy advisors. Uh, and we also track numbers of certified energy managers, which are, which are more important uh, in, in providing energy management services in the commercial and industrial sector, whereas the energy advisors are working more on the residential side. Um, so you can see here, Nova Scotia fares quite well on, uh, on numbers of energy advisors benchmarked against uh, the numbers, numbers of houses, single detached and attached houses in each province, um, but really is leading the pack actually in certified energy managers, which is, which is interesting. And, and I, you know, we, like, we think it probably positions Nova Scotia to kind of provide um, that energy management consulting expertise for, for a lot of Atlantic Canada. Okay, moving on. Uh, okay, so another really important area of energy efficiency policy specific to buildings are um, energy rating and disclosure initiatives. So this is, you know, assessing the energy performance, energy efficiency performance of houses and commercial buildings um, and multi-unit residential buildings, of course, and then finding some way to disclose that information so that it is available to potential buyers or, you know, the public at large to help kind of create a market for energy efficiency, really bring energy efficiency information out into the, into the public sphere. So our scorecard tracks mandatory initiatives and voluntary, voluntary initiatives. So a mandatory initiative requires a certain type of building to undergo some form of energy rating and then preferably mandatory disclosure. Um, whereas a voluntary initiative, you know, makes that, makes those, uh, makes those services available, but doesn't require anyone to do it. So, uh, you know, our latest tracking shows that Ontario continues to be the only province with a mandatory province-wide uh, commercial building rating and disclosure policy. Um, this is something that, you know, we at Efficiency Canada think is gonna be really important for other provinces to, uh, to really start getting a move on. Um, there are a number of voluntary province-wide initiatives specifically in Nova Scotia for both residential and commercial buildings. Um, in Quebec and Manitoba, there are some voluntary initiatives, but not necessarily um, involving the residential side. Some interesting developments that we've seen of late are their step toward not just mandatory requirements for energy rating and disclosure, but a plan to move toward building performance standards, specifically at the municipal level in Montreal and Vancouver. So this is something that we, you know, at Efficiency Canada would really like to see provinces kind of take province wide and, and really push that along. Um, and finally, I should note also in, in, and I think we'll come back to this at the end of the presentation, um, New Brunswick in its most recent climate change plan has, has, a st has put out some commitments to develop um, some energy rating and disclosure initiatives. Next up. Okay, uh, this is my final slide. Uh, so just on building codes, again, a really relevant area of energy efficiency policy and pertin pertinent to the buildings discussion that we're having today. So as you probably know, uh, the most recent versions of the federal model codes were released um, last year. They're called the 2020 model codes, despite only being released in 2022. Um, but they're finally out, which is great. And so now provinces need to adopt them and implement them into their own uh, provincial building code legislation. Um, so these codes are tiered codes. That means there's a number of different kind of levels within them of progressively more, uh, progressively higher energy efficiency requirements. Um, and the top tier uh, on, on the, on the uh, in both codes, so both codes, I mean the, the code for, that applies largely to residential buildings and the code that applies to larger commercial buildings, the top tier is equivalent to a net zero energy ready building. 
So a building built to that standard is capable of providing all the energy that it would need to uh, you know, carry on its functions. Now, provincial, a provincial code reconciliation agreement um, kind of commits the provinces to adopt the new codes within 24 months. Um, it's unclear exactly how hard and fast that reconciliation agreement will hold, but that is what at least we are expecting to happen. Um, but we do see a number of provinces that are moving a little bit faster to bring, uh, to bring these codes into effect. Um, Nova Scotia is one of the provinces that has uh, you know, committed to adopting at least one half of the codes, the code for, lar for larger commercial buildings um, on a little bit speedier schedule, specifically by September, uh, 2023. That's my understanding that um, the province has also um, said that, they, that it intends to adopt the residential code as well. Although at the time of doing the scorecard, uh, we, we had only known that they had committed to adopting the commercial side. Uh, so the, really the important next step that we think, the, the way we see it at Efficiency Canada um, and we do see some provinces and also territories taking these steps is to, to make a public commitment that, to reach that net zero energy ready level of the codes by 2030. And, and also to go beyond that and establish a very clear uh, pathway or timeline for moving up those tiers within the codes so that they, get, they can get to, the, to that end goal by the time that they need to be, uh, that they need to be there. Um, and one final thing that I should say, we also track, uh, we ask provinces to say whether or not municipalities have the autonomy within their province to, uh, to adopt a higher tier of the code than what is the provincial base code. Uh, this, is how it le this is how it kind of works in British Columbia, uh, where there's been a stepped energy efficiency code in place for some time, sorry, tiered, stepped, they're called stepped in British Columbia, um, but ultimately there's different levels. Um, and in British Columbia, different municipalities have the ability to go above and beyond the provincial base code. Uh, so that's something that we would like to see provinces give their municipalities the ability to do as well. Okay, that's it for my section. All right, thanks, James. Um, hey, everyone, my name is Brendan. I'm uh, the Director of Policy Research at Efficiency Canada. Um, so I'm going to talk about some areas where Nova Scotia could advance energy efficiency policy further um, by sharing some upcoming opportunities, as well as some leadership that we're seeing in other jurisdictions that uh, Nova Scotia could, could look to emulate. So following up on James's discussion of the building codes, I mean, as James said, uh, these new model codes that the federal government develops and then provinces can adopt, it, they're, they're different. It's no longer just a minimum standard. It's now these multiple performance tiers that you can move up towards that net zero energy ready commitment. And given that Nova Scotia has a net zero emissions commitment for the entire province, and that's the goal of its latest climate plan, you know, an obvious place to start is by making all new buildings net zero compatible. Um, so when I looked at the Nova Scotia climate plan, I didn't see that in there. That is disappointing. Um, but one new opportunity that could change that is uh, we are anticipating something to come out from the federal government quite soon, which is going to be called the Building Code Acceleration Fund. And this is something that we advocated for and was a commitment um, in the federal emission reduction plan. And this we anticipate will be a federal fund with the purpose of helping provinces build capacity in their local markets so that they can comfortably adopt those upper tiers of the building code and move towards that net zero compatible standard. Um, so an important part of preparing for um, building codes is, is not just adopting them in law, but also having the resources to ensure compliance uh, with those codes. And this is something we track in the scorecard as well. And we're hoping that this federal fund um, will support things like studies of the level of compliance in local markets, um, technical assistance manuals, things like state colder collaboratives, something we saw in BC that can help myth bust, can help grapple with all those nitty gritty barriers that need to be cleared um, for provinces to, to adopt uh, better building codes. Um, if we go to the next slide, um, an important policy which is finally gaining momentum across the country 
is requiring home energy labels when a home is sold or rented, right? So this is a pretty basic and important piece of information about the performance of a building. Um, these labels, they can play several roles. I mean, one is to help value um, energy efficiency better in, in real estate markets, um, but it can also be very useful to organizations like Efficiency Nova Scotia to better coordinate retrofit strategies. So, for instance, using some of those data to better coordinate similar retrofit measures and bundling them together. Um, and so we're starting to see a trend now in Canadian jurisdictions moving towards this policy. Uh, Ontario was about to adopt it, you know, a number of years ago, but it backed away uh, largely due to concerns over slowing down their um, housing sales process in a very hot real estate market at the time. But there's other concerns, like perhaps, you know, wasting the valuable time of, of in-person energy advisors. So to overcome some of those concerns, we're seeing now in BC and Alberta, they're moving towards virtual energy levels, right? Where the performance of a home is estimated using data on things like the age of the building or you know, characteristics like shared walls or number of corners in a building. Um, you know, so this allows that label to be put um, on say a real estate transaction relatively easily. If somebody still wants an in-person assessment, they can get that done. So in BC, they're describing this as perhaps there's some buildings that are you know, too unique um, to get an estimate. So there's still room for those, those in-person evaluations or in-person audits. Um, and this should really be a policy we think that Nova Scotia could should think about and is able to implement because I know that Efficiency Nova Scotia has been doing research and has been doing pilots on virtual labels. Um, but for some reason, we haven't seen that make it into the climate action plan or, or as, a, as a policy yet. Um, so next policy area is another trend we're seeing that James mentioned. Alyssa, if you can flip the slide. Thank you. Is um, mandatory is so James was talking about mandatory energy reporting from large buildings. This is now moving towards mandatory performance standards, right? Um, so we have a, a mandatory standard for, for new buildings. Um, but you know, sorry, we have mandatory standards now for new buildings through building codes, but if we want to hit the climate goals, we really need to think about those existing buildings. And this is now a policy focused on the larger buildings, so commercial buildings or larger residential buildings, that's really talking about what performance should we expect um, from those building owners and from those landlords. And what we're seeing in Vancouver and Montreal is that they're requiring energy use reporting and then are developing both greenhouse gas emission and energy intensity benchmarks for different building types. And the jurisdiction that is probably farthest ahead on this is New York City, where large buildings have mandatory GHG intensity limits starting in 2024. And so this chart, if you can see it, is, is trying to show how that's working. There are increasingly better building performance requirements shown by you know, those decreasing horizontal bars of greenhouse gas intensity in 2024, 2030, 2050. And then those bar graphs are showing the actual GHG intensity of different building types grouped from worst to best. So you can see that you know, the worst performing buildings are going to be captured under this policy in the early years and are going to have to upgrade. Um, but it also gives that long-term signal that when undertaking a retrofit, you might want to just retrofit to that 2050 um, net zero compatible standard, right? And these performance standards, they can relate to greenhouse gases, they can relate to energy, but they can also relate to health and safety. So for instance, you might want to say, buildings should be able to maintain internal temperature for a reasonable amount of time, say in the event of a power outage, um, or make sure you know buildings are able to provide air conditioning, right? Perhaps through heat pumps or, or district cooling systems um, so they can act as cooling centers during extreme heat events. Um, but you know, all this is, uh, I think, moving towards thinking about the types of buildings we need to adapt to climate change with some of that health and safety requirements, but also 
um, defining net zero performance and making it mandatory. And again, that's really important for Nova Scotia, which has some very good infrastructure, um, some of the best in the country for you know, incentive-based policies, but is starting to lag behind perhaps when we look at mandating um, net zero performance. So if we go to the next slide, um, Alyssa mentioned friendly competition. So I wanna issue a warning to folks in Nova Scotia who might be celebrating this high rank that they've received in the in scorecards in past years, because there's actually some interesting things happening right next door in New Brunswick. Um, New Brunswick is typically scored in the middle of the pack in our scorecards. Um, but in September, they came out with a new climate plan, and it includes some quite significant energy efficiency policies in particular. This is after our previous scorecards were used quite extensively um, by the Auditor General in that province. Um, so in New Brunswick, we're seeing a commitment to that net zero energy ready building code by 2030. We're seeing them moving up those performance tiers quite rapidly starting in 2023. Um, they've committed to moving forward with building labeling and disclosure and then requiring those building labels at the time of sale. There's a plan to phase out oil use in all buildings um, is my understanding by 2030. Uh, they're gonna require large industry to do GHG planning and reporting. Um, they're also setting clear energy efficiency targets for electricity and then minimum funding levels for non-electric low-income and indigenous programs. Those levels are not nearly as aggressive of what Nova Scotia is already achieving, um, but embedding you know, energy efficiency into energy planning and having those clear targets, I think, is also an important signal. So these are all things that um, are missing in Nova Scotia's climate plan. Um, so if New Brunswick implements these policies, uh, they're going to be doing a lot better in, in future scorecards. Um, so next slide, I wanted to just finish off by giving you some ideas of how you can use this scorecard. Um, we really see it as a, as a tool or a, a service for provincial activists and, and for policy development within the provinces. Um, so please consider sending an email very quickly, just sharing the scorecard um, with your ministers provincially and perhaps with your local MLA. Um, that can make a big difference in just getting it on people's radars. Um, when this building code acceleration fund comes out from the federal government, which we think will be imminent, um, we'd really encourage you to you just ask your provincial government, how are you going to use this funding? Are you going to take advantage of this funding? And when is Nova Scotia going to align its building codes with its net zero emissions goal? And then finally, um, please consider writing to your member of parliament uh, federally on the need to expand that oil to heat pump initiative into a national solution for all low to moderate income Canadians. So that means you know, not just mechanical systems, but building envelope improvements and some of those non-energy upgrades perhaps within Nova Scotia being part of that program. But if you know anyone outside of Atlantic Canada, please tell them to write to their member of parliament um, because low-income Canadians in the rest of Canada are really the ones being left out um, to who don't use heating oil as much as, as uh, in Nova Scotia. And we have a very easy letter writing tool. If you follow the link to that website, um, you can easily uh, plug in your, um, your postal code and, and write a letter. So that is it from us. Um, thanks for allowing us to present the scorecard and very happy to discuss or answer questions. Awesome, thank you guys. That was very comprehensive. I know that uh, a lot of our volunteers at EAC have a pretty, uh, a lot of interest in, in buildings lately and especially uh, building codes. So I believe that I'll definitely be passing along some of this information. <laughs> um, yeah, so just a reminder for folks, um, if you have a question, uh, you can pop it in the chat under the, the question and answer area. Um, and we will do our best to answer that for you. Um, and I'm just going to go ahead and get started with the first one. 
Um, and it is, why are some territories not scored? Does this imply they do not have climate plans? Do they follow the federal plan? Great question. James, do you want to take that one? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, okay. So uh, it's true that the territories have not historically been included in our scorecard on every single metric um, over the years, although we have been working to, to do that. There's a number of challenges that 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 kind of make it a little bit difficult to incorporate the territories into the whole scorecard in the same way as we do the provinces and uh you know without being able to do that effective without being able to kind of include them on every single metric in the same way that we do the provinces it, it produces a number of challenges in terms of producing that that aggregate score um this most recent year we we're quite happy that we were able to include yukon on all the metrics and that is due uh, in large part to uh, you know the efforts of the people that we worked with uh, within the Yukon government who really put in a lot of time and effort to uh, to make sure that um, you know our information request that we send out to to all the provinces was was answered as best as they could um, now the other province the other sorry the other territories we do track the information, a lot of the information that you've seen in the presentation today, um, but because we're not able to um, score it necessarily in the same way or overall scoring for both none of it and Northwest Territories, um, you might not have seen them reflected in some of the charts with the quantitative indicators that that we presented today. Um, it's a it's a bit of a work in the progress. You know, we are still working on and on enhancing our ability and uh, both to track things that are happening in the territories and also to to develop the methodologies to kind of uh, evaluate and benchmark them along the provinces in a fair and, and non-biased way. Um, you can go to our online policy database, which is a bit of a companion, a kind of companion project to the scorecard, where we summarize a number of different policy items um, for all the provinces and territories. Um, uh, and you might be able to find more information uh, that wasn't necessarily scored in the scorecard, but information that we've been tracking um, from that website. So if you wanted to do that, you could access that database at uh, database.efficiencycanada.org. I'm pretty sure that's the URL. Okay, well, oh, sorry, did I cut someone off? <laughs> I'll move on to the next question then, um, which also has a little bit to do with your scoring system. So why is the program score, this might be out of context, so if it is, just let me know. <laughs> why is the program score out of 17 while the industry is only out of five points, especially when many sources say that industry is responsible for 60% um, of emissions? And then it has a follow-up question of, can you comment on how the scorecard marking scale was created? Um, yeah, this is probably another question that, that, uh, that I can take. Um, okay, so uh, a couple things. Um, you, the, the person that's asking this question is definitely right that the program section in the scorecard is worth um, more points than the industry section in the scorecard. Um, so just to recap, there's five kind of chapters in the scorecard. Um, there's the program section. There's a section that looks at enabling initiatives. There's a section that looks at building code or sorry, buildings related policy. Um, there's a transportation section and an industry section. Um, now we, in developing our methodology to kind of score and weight the energy efficiency policy across these different areas, we, we initially kind of did so in a way that was informed by a 2018 study by Natural Resources Canada and the International Energy Agency to assess the energy efficiency potential in those end use sectors. Um, so our initial kind of weighting of those sections was based uh, in part on that, on that study. Now things have changed over the years. Um, programs has, is definitely worth more. It's actually worth 40 out of 100 points in the most recent scorecard and the industry section is worth seven. Um, it's true, definitely true that industry 
um, comprises a very large share of Canadian uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, but from an energy efficiency standpoint, it's a little bit trickier. Uh, the industry section is very, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Heterodox. So um, different industrial subsectors with different levels of energy efficiency potential and different kind of custom initiatives that you would do to improve energy efficiency in those facilities are tend to be located in specific provinces. All of which is to say, it really makes it challenging to kind of develop a, a metric that you can that you can apply across the provinces and territories equally. So what we've done is we've weighted the program section um, proportionally higher because it's in the program section that a lot of the quantitative information about energy savings and spending on energy efficiency programs is found. And those programs are, are cross-cutting. So those programs are getting energy savings from the residential sector. They're also getting it from commercial and industrial. Uh, so we kind of put more points into the program section uh, in reflection of its cross-cutting nature. And in the industrial section, we focus largely on, to date, we focused largely on energy management initiatives in the industrial sector, which is something that is broadly applicable across all the provinces and all the industrial subsectors. Awesome. <laughs> okay, I'm just gonna keep going through these questions. Um, so another question, okay, power generated in each province slash territory vary in GHG or greenhouse gas intensity per kilowatt hour. Does the scorecard take this into account? I can answer that. Um, so the short answer is no. And the reason is because uh, policymakers could decide to save energy or electricity in this case, you know, for, for lots of reasons. Um, so we're not, you know, we're, we're interested in the achievements in energy efficiency and energy savings, recognizing that lots of policymakers and jurisdictions will have different policy rationales for achieving those savings or targeting those savings, um, of which I would say greenhouse gas reductions is only one. So, you know, one trend that we really see in tracking policy throughout the provinces right now is that um, provinces with very clean electricity systems actually are finding that they really need to save electricity um, as part of a robust climate plan, because the more electricity they save, the more they can electrify, you know, heating and transportation systems. And provinces that have been saying that they don't need to save electricity, like Quebec and Ontario in the past five years are now actually finding they're in major supply shortages um, because of because they weren't, you know, forward looking. So Quebec is doubling its electricity savings target. Ontario is just um, you know, replaced funding that was cut. Um, you know, and those are, you know, if you have a justification saying, well, you know, we're taking in account G intensity and we don't need to save electricity because of we're already clean. Well, it hasn't worked out very well in those in those provinces. Um, but you know, just to reiterate, there's there's lots of reasons to save electricity, even if it's clean. That could be, you know, reductions in energy poverty, it could be the economic benefits of not having to dam new rivers, avoid power plants. Um, but you know, certainly throughout the scorecard, we try to track multiple different metrics, recognizing that there's different priorities the provinces might have. So, so Nova Scotia, it makes a lot of sense to save kilowatt hours, save energy, and to reduce peak power, for example, because the more energy you save, it doesn't really matter what time of the day it's saved, you're, you're displacing fossil fuels largely in the electricity savings in your electricity sector. You know, other places might be more focused on say, those peak demand savings. So we actually, we didn't show it to you, but we have a metric in there for, um, you know, peak demand saving benefits as, as well. So that's why we try to track lots of different metrics throughout the scorecard, um, you know, recognizing that there's very different priorities in different provinces. That's a good question. 
Um, okay, so I think we have one more question, unless another one pops up, but it says, can you say anything about the role of the insurance industry in driving or not driving efficiency improvements or heating system upgrades in buildings in Nova Scotia slash Canada? I am asking because I've been hearing that some residential insurance policies are at odds with switching to heat pumps. Understand that this might be outside of a bit of today's webinar. I can try to take that because I did have a discussion about that recently. Um, I was surprised to hear that. And, and uh, there was a news story about that, I think, in New Brunswick recently that, um, yes, it does seem to be the case that some insurance companies are reluctant to um, insure buildings converting to heat pumps because they seem to have the idea that heat pumps don't have a backup system. And that just seems to be like a kind of a funny education issue in that, you know, most heat pumps, well, heat pumps typically have a backup system. It can be a quite simple electric resistance backup that's, you know, integrated um, within the heat pump. And um, there are insurance benefits to having that type of a backup versus, say, a fuel oil system backup where you could have spills and things like that. Um, so I, I think, uh, you know, some of the federal policymakers and, and the out and the, um, the this this heat pump switching program or sorry, fuel switching program from oil to heat pump, I think they're aware of this. And um, I think the solution is simply some education of um, insurance providers of uh, how these systems actually work. Um, and, you know, I think the program and you know the good practice to have a backup system in a cold canadian climate and in any heat pump even if you don't end up using that backup system that that often i hope that answers your question mark yeah that's a good question i think that has been coming up i've, I've heard like a couple questions about that just over the past couple of weeks and so definitely a, a good question that's on people's minds and I guess people are concerned about that. So um, I'm not seeing any more questions in the chat at this point, um, but if you do have any final thoughts, feel free to pop them in there. Um, Claire, I think there's one that I, about um, from Nigel. It was asking about electricity savings as a percentage oh, of yeah. sales. Oh yeah, sorry, Nigel. <laughs> um, I can read it off and then we can do our thing. But uh, yeah, with regards to the first slide, electricity savings as a percentage of sales, does this include the savings from moving to heat pumps from heating oil? Do you want me to take that or Alyssa, do you want to answer? You go for it, Brendan. Sure. Um, yeah, so that wouldn't be included there um, because, but we do include any um, subsent. If you're moving um, from fuel oil to a heat pump, um, you might be using slightly more electricity, but you're saving on the fossil fuels. Um, so actually, the way we count that in the scorecard is. Um, we we would count that as a fossil fuel savings. So there's actually a metric on electricity savings. But yeah, I don't think we showed it to you, but there's also a, a separate metric in there on fossil fuel savings as a percentage of domestic demand as a percentage of sales. And we would count any savings from fuel switching um, in that metric. And uh, that uh, electrification and will, I think, become increasingly important. And we're hoping to see those fossil fuel savings um, being driven up in future years. And I suspect they should be driven up. And then on this issue of, you know, yes, that might increase electric load somewhat, um, although it doesn't have to, have to overall if you're also doing good, you know, insulation and air sealing and things like that. Um, and that we... There's some provinces, this gets kind of nerdy, but there's some provinces that actually count that against their electricity savings target. Uh, Manitoba does that. And um, 
we uh, we don't think that's good practice. We think that should be just counted as a general increase in electric load and, and not as a minus sign against those electricity savings. It kind of doesn't provide a good incentive for a program administrator to you know, do a, what, what should be a beneficial fuel switch from a fossil fuel to electricity. Um, it makes a lot more sense to perhaps define um, what type of beneficial fuel switching you know you want, which could be some parameters like it needs to reduce GHGs overall. Perhaps it needs to not put undue um, peak demand um, peak demands on your electricity system, things like that. Okay, awesome. And I think we just have one comment from our Facebook live stream, and I think it was following up on Mark's comment about insurance, and it says some insurance companies also don't insure homes with solar panels, which I haven't heard before, but very interesting. Okay, I think <laughs> that now I have gone through all the questions um, and hope I haven't missed anybody. Um, with that, I think we'll wrap up. Um, for those that aren't aware, I think Efficiency Canada hosts their own webinars on Fridays. And I th think you're hosting one tomorrow. Um, yes, we are. Okay, great. Well, if you're interested on the, um, and they put on webinars all the time, so you can check them out. And um, thank you, Brendan, Alyssa, and James for your time. Um, the webinar, uh, we have the live stream that'll be kept on the Facebook page. And we're also gonna put a, a recording up on our website. Um, so thank you all for your time. And um, I hope everybody learned a lot. <laughs> I definitely learned a few new things tonight. So that was great. And um, yeah, for our attendance, thank you so much for coming. And um, you can check back on our website page under the Better Building Speaker Series um, to stay up to date on, on more upcoming webinars as we're scheduling them. And uh, thank, thank you all for coming.